Even our jogging routine requires us to track speed and distance for maximum effectiveness. That's how we measure our progress and know if we are doing things right. Needless to say, running a business is a bit more complex than jogging. And there are numerous aspects we need to keep track of with the help of metrics. But when it comes to DevOps, measurement is even more intense. Hello, my name is Igor Pavlenko. I'm a quality assurance competence leader at Altexsoft. In this final episode, I'll talk about tracking your DevOps success. Here, we will discuss why metrics are so important in DevOps, what we can measure, and how to choose the right metrics for your specific product. Let's get to it. DevOps is built around constant feedback and measurement of success. As we strive to reach our thick productivity and constantly improve, metrics become some of the most crucial things for DevOps success. Let's recall COUNTS, the acronym that explains the five main principles of DevOps. The first three letters stand for culture, automation, and the lean approach, all explained in previous videos. Now, M and S stand for measurement and sharing. The measurement principle is in charge of performance tracking. This could be metrics that measure process performance, like lead time for change, or track actual software performance, like application crash rate. The results of the measurements are then shared across the team to give visibility to the product and process success. This metric exchange is continuous. It allows us to spot problems and improve how we build software. Obviously, to improve continuously, first we need to understand what to measure and pick the right metrics for the task. The chosen indicator makes sense when it is tied to the business objective and is relevant to both development and operations teams. So here are some core metrics that every DevOps team should use. We'll start from productivity measurement, as that's the main feature every DevOps adopter is concerned about. The first and the most important metric is mean time to change. With this metric, we measure the time for a feature, idea or fix to come alive. Here we consider the time period between ideation to actual implementation of a feature. The final point of measurement occurs when the idea turns into a feature that the end user can get a handle on. Mean time to change, or MTTC, measures a cycle duration which can be interpreted as the general team performance indicator. As DevOps team work in small cycles to deliver value faster, the changes to MTTC show if our delivery speed has improved. There are also lower-level metrics tied to MTTC. They may be helpful if you struggle to understand what specific part of the process is lagging the whole DevOps cycle. For example, we can use change lead time to measure the moment between the start of coding up until the feature is ready. All in all, both metrics help us fine-tune our workflow and monitor whether the cycle time shortens due to changes in our DevOps process. The second important metric is deployment frequency. Put simply, the faster we deploy, the more value we generate for the customer. So deployment frequency shows the level of our DevOps maturity. Low performers can have weekly or even monthly deploys, while more mature DevOps teams can have several deploys per day. But shipping new features faster means nothing if your code is bad. So we also need some quality metrics. Bugs are inevitable and it's important to track the quality of code and how fast we can find and fix bugs. So let's start with a group of metrics that help us measure and the mean time for issue resolution. There are four vital metrics in this group that focus on a specific time period of a quality control and software reliability. First comes mean time to failure. In a nutshell, this metric indicates the average lifespan of a software feature, the time it takes for it to break. Mean time to failure can be calculated by taking the total number of hours an item has worked divided by the total number of items you track. For example, there are three items you track that failed after 4, 9 and 12 hours respectively. The total time is 25 hours. Divided by 3, we get to average 8.3 hours to failure. So, the shorter mean time to failure will indicate there are problems with quality control. Then, we also need to measure mean time to detection. This is the average time the team spends to find the problem once it emerges. We can calculate the MTTD by taking the total time spent on detection and divided by the total number of incidents. And generally, the lower the number, the better your DevOps team handles bugs detection. Next, we must count how fast the bugs are actually fixed. Here we'll use the mean time to recovery. 
The time we calculate here starts from detection moment to the point when the issue is fully resolved. And the formula is the same. We take the total time spent on fixing problems and divide it by the number of bugs we fixed during this period. So, obviously, the lower the indicator, the better our bug fixing processes are. The fourth metric is mean time between failures. This one is similar to the mean time to failure, but here we can see for how long a particular component normally works before dying. The difference is that we need to count total hours of operation for a given component and then divide it by the total number of breaks. It helps us compare different components to each other and pinpoint those that need architectural changes. These four metrics are relevant to the overall DevOps processes. But as we emphasize the quality of our product, we also need to measure the quality control. Quality control tries to catch bugs before they go into production but some percentage always evades the tests. So, it's also important to check defect escape ratio. Defect escape ratio is calculated by comparing the number of bugs caught before the production and the total number of bugs, including those found in auto deployment. For instance, it may seem that 10 bugs found in production this month is a lot, but if we put it into perspective and compare those 10 to 300 that we caught before deployment, it means that we aren't going so bad. While these two results are compared, they can also be used as a separate metric. The value of defect escape ratio is to see how our development and QA teams are working. And generally, we want to decrease the number of bugs going to production as much as possible. Now, the last category of metrics I want to discuss is software reliability and other service level agreement metrics. So let's look at the indicators that complement DevOps practices. Every product has some form of service level agreement, or SLA. This is a number of requirements for the quality of software you build. One of the main indicators to correspond with the SLA is the metric called server uptime. This is the percentage of time your service is available for use. The calculation is pretty straightforward. We just drag the data from monitoring to indicate the total uptime and check the percentage of downtimes. Usually, the uptime is expected to be 99.9%, .9%, and the more nines you have after the point, the better. For some critical services, 99.99% .99 availability compared to 99.9% .9 makes a world of difference. For instance, if you're a financial service and you process transactions every minute or every second, having the uptime of 99.9 .9 means that you have about 9 hours of downtime per year. These hours may equal millions lost on transaction fees. Another important metric is AppDEX, or Application Performance Index. Besides traditional software metrics that measure feature or service performance, AppDEX helps us understand the relative user satisfaction with the performance. Here is how we calculate it. First, we define a response time that is considered a good one. Let's say 0.7 seconds is a good response time for a given feature. Then we collect response time samples to compare. The samples are divided into three groups. Good samples that are equal or shorter than a desired response time. Tolerable, ranging from more than 0.7 seconds and up to say 3 seconds. And bad, often counted as 4 times longer than the desired time. Finally, the score is calculated with the total number of good samples plus half of the tolerable divided by the total number of false samples. AppDEX is a helpful metric for understanding how customers are satisfied with the application or a specific feature performance. So we can measure the score of a business critical features and define whether they need any improvement. The last aspect I want to mention here is the automation infrastructure. In DevOps, we trust scripts a lot. As a result, we create another layer of software which serves the needs of the DevOps team. So we want to ensure that the infrastructure of automation is healthy and reliable enough. My suggestion is to apply the quality metrics mentioned here to this part of software infrastructure as well. So, these are the three categories that cover the main aspects of DevOps. Now you are likely to ask a fair question. What set of metrics do I need and how do I choose the right ones? Well, there is no definite answer, but there are a few factors to use as a practical guide. First of all, DevOps is a culture of improvement and observability. So we want our processes to be measured and controlled from all sides. Neglecting any part of the DevOps workflow will cause the whole pipeline to break. So you have to use the score metrics in the first place and then complement your measurement with low-level indicators. 
Second, as I've said, metrics must be tied to the business objectives because the final goal of improving technical processes is to generate more value for the customer. So the set of metrics will include more or less specific items depending on what you want to achieve with DevOps. This is the end of my DevOps series. I hope that was entertaining and informative. Thank you for watching. Remember to subscribe and see you next time.